So for today's session, which is called Case Studies in Government Responses to COVID-19, how has technology been used to address women's health needs and what are the gaps? So this is the second um, in our webinar series. Sorry, I can just advance the slides. For those of you that were able to join us for the launch of this series last month, um, you know, uh, we, we welcome you back. Um, and you may recall that this series is focuses on the gender dimensions of digital technologies for health with a focus on translation of evidence to policy and practice-based learning in low and middle income countries. We're trying to hold monthly sessions and workshops. Um, traditionally, these are falling on the last Thursday of every month. This is the one exception to that. Um, and so this is the first of two sessions in March. Um, and you only need to register for one, se one session to be invited to all subsequent ones. So we hope that you'll join us on the, on the following ones. I'll show you the schedule for those in the next slide. Um, the webinar series is organized by a consortium of stakeholders from the United Nations University, the uh, University of Cape Town, which is where I'm from, um, and as well BBC Media Action. So I'm pleased to have my colleagues Claudia Lopez and Sarah Chamberlain um, joining me here as well. We're helping to sort of co-convene this along with Vidya um, and Colum. So we, we thank you all um, for, for being here today. I'll just get the slides advancing, hopefully. So this series is a 12 part series. Um, you can see we're on this um, second series. Um, this is the first in a two part series on um, COVID. Um, the second one will be on March 25th and focus on gender based violence and technology use during COVID. So we really hope you'll join us again for that. Um, and you'll see a range of other topics that we hope to have um, throughout the year. And we additionally hope to complement this with two workshops. The first in June will be a sort of a deep dive into designing process evaluations with a gender lens for digital health solutions. And the last one to be held later in the year will focus on metrics for measuring access to and use of digital solutions. So we welcome your participation in any and all of these events. Um, and uh, yeah. I forgot to introduce myself, but my name is Amnesty Lefebvre. I'm um, joined today by Tikus Tamrat. She is a technical officer within the Department of Sexual and Reproductive Health at the World Health Organization. Her work focuses on the use of digital technologies to accelerate health systems improvements and support sexual and reproductive health. So we thank you very much for joining us, Tikus. Do you want to say anything? Thank you, Amnesty, for that introduction and kicking us off. Um, so today, it looks like we have a very packed uh, and interesting set of speakers. I would like to first introduce a colleague, um, Derek Munene, who will, is a unit head of capacity building and collaboration within the WHO Department of Digital Health and Innovation. And I would like to invite him to provide us with some introductory remarks on the activities happening within WHO and digital activities like regarding COVID. Um, Derek, welcome, you have the floor. All right, thank you so much, uh, Amnesty and Tigis. Thank you so much uh, for <laughs> inviting us to this uh, very important session uh, regarding government case studies in the response to COVID-19 with a special focus on women's health. Uh, we would like to basically, um, you know, contribute to this important discussion uh, that has been put together by uh, an, ex you know, uh, a, 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 a collective body of experts. We would appreciate the fact that, uh, you know, COVID-19 has taught us quite a lot of lessons in terms of collaboration, working together, and also supporting government efforts uh, in terms of responding to the, the, the pandemic. Uh, and so my brief talk will really be emphasizing the need for a collective action in terms of uh, responding to the pandemic using digital tools as appropriate and also planning for the future, making sure that our future interventions are both resilient, robust and also sustainable and also making sure that countries are ready for the next pandemic. Uh, within my role here at uh, the World Health Organization, uh, my responsibilities is really around uh, supporting collaboration activities and also making sure that digital health capacity programs are put in place to support our member states in the journey towards uh, implementing digital health solutions and also evaluating the impact of those solutions. We recently released um, a number of products at the end of last year uh, that respond to our global strategy and how to implement the as aspirations of the global strategy. The global strategy itself has uh, a number of principles that include gender equity, inclusiveness, and also universality. 
uh, gender equity is one of the key areas the global strategy speaks about with its uh, four, four objectives that include uh, supporting member states to uh, better manage the digital health solutions and making sure that our member states themselves are in the driving seat, reducing pilots, planning for scale, and also making sure that the different arrangements to sustain that capacity are in place. And, and so this one particular key objective for us is quite instrumental and because it's a future of making sure that the solutions that we are putting in place to respond to the pandemic are not only usable now, but also usable for the future. So that one objective is one key area that we're really emphasizing and supporting. A second key area, key area within the strategy focuses on ensuring that we're using national strategies as an entry point. We've seen during the pandemic a number of calls for appropriate technologies such as telemedicine, e-learning, medical records, and now vaccination certificate standards. And so what we're doing at WHO is making sure that we are emphasizing that the fit for purpose appropriate solutions like telemedicine are implemented within the context of national digital strategies, which is a second objective of our global strategy. It's extremely important to ensure that we're taking care of the vulnerable, we're taking care of uh, the disadvantaged and marginalized populations, and more particularly making sure that we are advancing digital health in an equitable fashion and women's health is extremely key, uh, given the fact that uh, women are usually more affected when it comes to disruption of services, when it comes to lo lockdowns, and key services such as um, reproductive health services, whether it's antenatal care services, family planning, or labor and delivery, women actually get more affected than the men in that perspective. And for the past 15 years, my work actually has been devoted towards supporting digital interventions that address women's health. And so I'm quite uh, interested to, to, to be part of this particular uh, conversation and hopefully future conversation will be part of uh, those particular conversations. Third objective in our strategy focuses of, on making sure that governance is strengthened and the measurement of digital solutions at national level. We're keen to make sure that governments are able to measure the maturity of the digital health solutions and in such a way that those solutions that show promise are expanded uh, in other areas as appropriate, building on what works and amplifying those success stories that countries are harvesting. Then our fourth objective, which is where women's health and gender equal rights uh, 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 comes to play is the objective around the advancing people-centered health uh, services. This is where our universal health coverage mandate comes to play, our people-centricity universal health coverage. We're keen with this fourth objective to make sure that we're supporting our member states to put people first and making sure that we're all inclusive and supporting primary health care services and Not also never, ensuring yeah. that in our you know, advancement of digitization, we are really putting people first. In UHC circles, we like to say leave no one behind, but in the digital age, we add by saying leave no one offline. With these remarks, I would like to encourage everybody to um, participate effectively. We have deployed a number of guides um, uh, on our WHO website. We just uh, released the Digital Health Investment and Implementation Guide that is intended to actualize our global strategy. We also have been advancing some key products uh, such as uh, smart guidelines to help the implementation of uh, digital solutions so that they're standards based and also a method of inventorying our solutions using inventory mechanisms such as the digital health atlas. What is also key is to make sure that we're advancing digital health literacy both for men and women and making sure that our health workers are able to use digital tools appropriately. It's usually not enough to deploy a tool but it's more comprehensive to ensure that the tools that were deployed are usable uh, by people that are expected to use those tools. With that, then I'd like to uh, pause here and wish everybody a very productive and successful uh, webinar. Over. Thank you, Derek. Thank you for that very comprehensive overview. And we're very pleased to also have you today. I'm just going to hand it back to Amnesty. Um, thank you for kicking us off, Derek, and Amnesty to just give us a lineup of the rest of the speakers for today as well as some ground rules that I forgot to mention earlier on. Um, over to you, Amnesty. 
Thanks so much, Tegas and Derek. What a, what a great introduction. Um, it, it sounds like you have no shortage of work happening over at WHO, so thank you for that. Um, so we're going to be followed, um, Derek's presentation uh, is going to be followed by one from Dr. Ter uh, Teresa Diaz, whom I'll introduce in, in just a second. Um, she'll be talking about the global impact of COVID-19 on reproductive, maternal, newborn, child, and adolescent health. Um, she'll speak for about 10 minutes, um, and then we're going to just do sort of quick clarification questions for two minutes after, um, just to try and keep um, the momentum going. Um, and so Dr. Diaz will be followed by a presentation from Dr. Andrew Boole, um, who is a professor at UCT and also um, representing the Western Cape Department of Health here in South Africa. Um, so we're very pleased he'll be, he'll be speaking about the Western Cape um, Province's response um, to COVID-19 and, and the use of technology um, to track and, and influence um, uh, the epidemic's impact on women's health and associated services. We'll then hear from Dr. Uh, Juan Antonio Perez, who's the executive director, um, 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 excuse me, the executive director from the Commission on Population and Development um, in the Philippines. And then our final speaker will be um, Dr. Radhan Krishnan, who's the principal secretary for health um, for the Health and Family Welfare Department um, for the government of Tamil Nadu in India. We'll close out today's sessions um, with some remarks from our discussants, um, Kenne Eskom from UNDP, and time permitting, our, our dear colleague um, Claudia Lopez um, from UNU. And then hopefully we'll have time for about 25 minutes of, of curated questions and answers. So as we sort of progress through throughout today, we just sort of, again, if you've just joined us, please introduce yourself in the chat. Tell us where you're from. Um, again, as I mentioned, panelists are going to speak for, for 10 minutes. This will be followed by two minutes of, you know, sort of really burning clarification questions. Otherwise, please hold questions for discussion. Um, and then, you know, again, you obviously please use the chat throughout to pose questions. Please live tweet. Um, and there are the hashtags on the screen. Um, so without further ado, Tikas, would you like to introduce Dr. Diaz, please? Thank you, Amnesty. And I, again, have a pleasure to introduce another fellow colleague, Dr. Teresa Diaz, who is the unit head for Epidemiology Monitoring and Evaluation Unit within the Maternal, Newborn, Child, Adolescent, and Aging Department at WHO. She will be presenting on the global impact of COVID-19 on reproductive maternal, newborn, child, and adolescent health on behalf of the WHO Sexual and Reproductive Health and Maternal newborn child adolescent aging departments. Um, thank you, Dr. Teresa Diaz, please uh, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, as Tigus already said, I'm going to be speaking about the global impact uh, COVID-19 on reproductive maternal newborn and child adolescent health. I'm gonna speak first about the indirect impact of COVID, then I'm gonna discuss some tools and resources, and then I'll provide a conclusion. So here is, um, a model, trying to, not a model, but a diagram looking at what could be the potential impacts of COVID-19 pandemic in women and children. And so what we showed here, there's some direct um, impact because of the response to COVID-19, like lockdowns and lim limitation of movement and school closures. And those impacts could have secondary impacts and it could improve the environment, but it could have worsening with psychosocial impacts and um, uh, that could be secondary harms uh, because of loss of income and, and other. And um, this could result in some positive or cleaner air, but there also could be depression and, and domestic abuse, which um, has been shown in undernutrition, et cetera. And um, this will impact our ability to improve the health and survival and thrive and transformation um, in women and children. And then there's the direct impact of COVID uh, in, in regards to um, the access to um, healthcare services, the, the lockdown, but also the fear to use those services that decrease uh, utilization of essential health services. And um, there's also direct impact of the health system itself being overwhelmed, lack of supplies, again, um, inability to provide the appropriate services that could reduce the coverage of essential health services for women and children. So what do we know about the indirect impact of COVID-19 on reproductive maternal newborn child and adolescent health? Before the pandemic, there was great progress in the health status for women and children and adolescents. Deaths for children under five had declined to all time low. Maternal deaths had dropped by more than 35% in the past two decades. 
Coverage of essential interventions on average around the world were exceeding 80%, such as immunization or skilled birth attendant or safe water. And um, greater political commitment uh, had been occurring. And, um, and to, we've had like commitments of over 186 billion in, in the past uh, decade to, actually less than a decade. Uh, to improve the women, children, and adolescent lives. So here is a survey that WHO did. It's called a Pulse Survey, but was a survey of, of different um, countries um, to try to get a sense of what was happening at, um, as far as disruption of surveys of uh, services. And this is uh, the responses that we received from May and July of 2020. And uh, what you can see here is whether it was partially disturbed or completely disturbed. And this is the percentage of our countries reporting this. And so we've had a lot of disruption to family planning services and antenatal care services, uh, routine immunization, both at facilities and outreach. But we also had disruption, some disruption of facility-based birth, sick child visits, and management of, of malnutrition. Uh, so we were having disruption of services during this um, time period that could have some long-term consequences. So even uh, that, those pulse surveys are just kind of reports of people at the national level, what they think is happening, but even the routine health information systems were demonstrating a decrease. Now, Part of it could be a decrease in reporting, but there really was some decreases in uh, utilization of services. And this is an example from um, ANC antenatal care attendants in the Lagos state of Nigeria. And you see a comparison of 2019 to 2020. So um, modeling was done to try to figure out, well, if you have these disruptions, what might happen in the future? And what we found for some of the models is that a 45% reduction in coverage of high impact uh, maternal and child health in interventions for six months in 118 low middle income countries. If this happened, it could result in a 1.1 uh, million additional child deaths and 56,700 additional maternal deaths. Um, there was another estimate that 117 million children that may miss measles vaccine. And um, there was an analysis that was done. They're saying if you continue, you, um, continue routine, uh, if you cannot continue routine um, immunization, probably you may lead to 8,300 additional deaths, while uh, suspending programs to avoid COVID-19 deaths could it lead, lead to another 702 child deaths from vaccine. Um, oh, let me explain that again. Continuing routine immunization programs with the risk of getting COVID infection could give you the 8,300 additional deaths. And um, if you just continued, uh, you would actually, without stopping, uh, you would save 700, 200. You would have, you could lead to, if you suspended it, you could lead to 700,000 child deaths, sorry. Um, Anti-RAV uh, interruption for six months would increase mother-to-child transmission for uh, HIV by approximately 1.6 times in one year. And another model found that 47 million women in 114 low and middle income countries may be unable to access modern contraception for six months. And this could result in 7 million unintended pregnancies. So there's also indirect impacts beyond the dis dis disruption of health services. There was some estimates that um, in 2020, about 40 million to 60 million additional children living in monetary poor households. There were projections also that it could result in additional 13 million child marriages and nearly 1.5 billion children and youth were out of school. And this is the unprecedented scale with 188 countries imposing countrywide closures. And this was during the first peak of the uh, pandemic. And we know that since then, they still continue to have a lot of school closures. And this could lead to not only to the problem with not getting your education, but poor nutrition, social isolation, and um, there's been evidence of increased child abuse. Next. 
So here are some tools and resources for monitoring essential uh, services um, for a sexual reproductive and terminal newborn child, adolescent health. I'm not going to go through this in great detail, but if you guys don't know what uh, the, there's the ACT Accelerator, which is a global collaboration with WHO and partners to accelerate development, production, and equitable use of COVID-19 diagnostics. And it has four pillars, diagnostics, treatment, vaccines, and health system strengthening. And part of the health system strengthening is to have available some of the monitoring tools that you see here. I'm gonna go more detail on the next slide. So here are some of the tools that are available. There's a hospital readiness and case management capacity for COVID-19 suite of tools so that you can see if the hospital's ready to respond, look at the diagnostics, and um, if there's a safe environment. And then there's the continuity of uh, essential health services in the context of COVID. And these are health facilities assessments to see if you're able to continue or are providing um, essential health services, both at the facility level and then another one to see what the community needs um, and demands are. We also develop a, a guidance of how to use routine health information systems to monitor disruptions. Because a lot of what you were seeing out there is to say, just look at this, look at this, but no one told you how to do the comparisons. No, you tell you what the shorter set of indicators should be. And so we've developed this guidance that looks at, the structured it in two parts. Um, part one is just um, overall essential health services. And then part of the, there's a specific module looking at reproductive, maternal, newborn, child, adolescent health, and immunization and nutrition. But the key is this, how do you use your health management information system within your facilities, your routine data, and how do you do the comparisons to previous year to this year to see if there's disruption and take action? Next. So in conclusion, the indirect impact of COVID-19 poses probably a greater threat to the health of pregnant women and children than the pandemic itself. And protecting the products will require multi-sectorial coordination, strengthening health service delivery, ensuring the quality of care, strengthening the information systems, conducting ongoing monitoring assessments, and also, of course, citizen engagement and in community empowerment. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Diaz. You kept it exactly to 10 minutes, so we, we oh. so appreciate that. <laughs> In addition to presenting um, just a sort of a really interesting overview of both the sort of the direct and indirect impacts and these sort of great sort of series of tools and resources that folks can draw on. So I'm going to introduce our next speaker now is um, Professor Andrew Bull. Um, he is the head of the Provincial Health Data Center um, here in the Western Cape Department of Health in South Africa. He's a public health physician by training, um, and he leads the Provincial Health Data Center, which cur curates platform-wide person-level digital health data to support patient care and service delivery. He's also the principal investigator for the African Health Information Exchange Initiative, which has been developing context-appropriate technology to assist public sector health services and functional data consolidation and interoperability. He's gonna to speak to us today about the digital health adaptations to support the response to the COVID-19 pandemic here in the Western Cape province of South Africa and efforts to track the epidemic's impact on women's health and associated services. So welcome, Andrew, um, over to you. Uh, thank, thanks very much, Amnesty and, and the organizers. It's a pleasure to be part of this session. And um, so I'm going to briefly just describe the context in which I work and the data systems and then go on to looking at how they've been ad adapted for the purposes of um, uh, the COVID-19 response. So if we can go on to the next slide, please. And the next. So the, I sit in the, in the provincial health department um, uh, in, the, in the province of about 7 million people. And these uh, kind of run charts are a representation of the burden of disease. And you'll see um, and the uh, um, purple, the very dominant uh, impact of HIV and TB uh, causing premature mortality. So the, the, the mountains are occurring a little bit earlier than, than some of the other conditions. Um, and you'll see, um, uh, particularly for women, and um, even in 20, even, even uh, over time as ARVs have become more prevalent, um, 
and and some chronic diseases like diabetes becoming very prevalent as well as uh, cause, causes of mortality um, for, uh, and, and increasingly in women. When COVID-19 uh, hit uh, uh, globally, there was some uncertainty about how impactful it would be in resource limited settings and in African settings. And the, the factors at play were that um, our age structures are generally much, much younger than uh, Europe and North America and some of the countries where uh, COVID uh, first hit. But at the same time, um, our health systems are weaker, so we may have had uh, higher mortality and also um, the very high prevalence of uh, comorbidities such as HIV. It was unknown at that stage to what extent they would be impactful um, from a morbidity and mortality perspective. And then the non-pharmaceutical interventions that were targeted at, at uh, restricting transmission, it was unclear to what extent those would be implementable in poorer countries. So um, as much as we should have been protected, there were also uncertainties about um, uh, uh, higher risk. Um, so I'm going to just talk to that a little bit if we can go to the next slide. So this is, the, this is an integrated graphic of the epidemic as it's played out in the Western Cape. And you can see uh, the gray bars being the cases. We've had two severe waves in uh, June, July, and then uh, over January, uh, over the New Year, January, January, uh, December, January. And you can see all the metrics, the red being the mortality, the yellow being the percentage of tests positive, uh, green being oxygen consumption, blue being hospitalization, uh, following that, that, that pattern. Um, next slide. And to put it into some, some context, if we were to take our mortality as we've measured it um, and put it on a league, league table, we would be somewhere near the top of the league table uh, at uh, deaths per million population, um, uh, irrespective of infection. And if we were to take excess mortality as measured on the population register, um, we'd be at the top of this league table, bearing in mind that we're not comparing to excess mortality. We, other countries are also reported mortality and maybe under ascertained. If you look on the right, you'll see the P-score, which is the pr pr proportion of deaths registered compared to expectations. So it's a measure of excess mortality and our excess mortality uh, in the Western Cape and nationally is towards the top of, the, of that list as well. Bearing in mind that some of the hardest hit countries such as Peru um, uh, who have very high P-scores are not on, on that chart. But it just shows you that Contrary to some expectations that COVID-19 has not been uh, impactful in Africa, that it has been uh, um, as impactful as uh, some of the worst of places in the world. Next slide. Um, and just to understand why our, um, the epidemic subsided uh, twice, so looking at serology uh, from blood donors, which we know is, is not necessarily representative, but um, it does suggest that uh, uh, the attack rate may already be as high as uh, over 60% in some provinces, but could be as low as 30%. And if we look at the next slide, you'll see that the uh, cases came down quite precipitously. One more slide. Um, at the same time, across almost all of our provinces after that vertical arrow, which is when we reintroduced um, uh, more, uh, more restrictions, suggesting that some of the reduction at least was due to uh, restrictions that were introduced, meaning that there's still some headroom for further, further infections. So it was probably a combination of infection and intervention. Next slide. To talk a bit about our digital health context. Um, so uh, Amnesty mentioned that I'm responsible for a data center where we harness all available digital health data. And it's not an EMR data in the traditional sense of rich countries, but uh, we do have a lot of administrative data and a unique identifier and can usefully put a lot of data together. We can just click through a few more um, click through. So the main reason why we put these data together is to support patient care. But one more, if we just advance one more, um, we are able to also use the data for operational analyses and also for research. And having this single environment has proved very useful to us. The most important ingredient in this environment is people. So if we go to the next slide. Um, okay, just a few, a little bit about, uh, about the environment is that we curate all data and person, person place and uh, concept. Next slide. Um, and we uh, make inferences based on um, uh, uh, trying to put a longitudinal record together and as well as to infer health conditions. Again, we don't have a lot of coding, so we have to use quite uh, complex methods of using ph pharmacy and um, laboratory and register data. Next. 
And this inference approach is quite, has been proven quite useful. We create virtual cohorts and we've described that in the paper that I, I referenced on the slide. And essentially for COVID-19, we created a COVID-19 virtual cohort. Next slide. And then from that virtual cohort, we uh, leverage a number of different um, uh, outputs, digital health outputs. Um, let's advance to from here. I'm a little bit anxious for time. Um, that's an example of a, of a clinical output in the next. And now I'm going to just look at some of the adaptations of the, of the system. So the first, the first adaptation was having a system in place that consolidates data and has a platform for accessing that data and has a platform for secure access. And especially because everybody suddenly had to start working remotely and that secure access was invaluable. Um, it meant that we could rapidly um, evolve a system. I'm not going to go through all the adaptations that we made. I think the slide conveys that we, there were a number of places that we could tweak specifically for the COVID needs. But um, adapting an, an imperfect system that you know well versus trying to land a new system uh, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a jurisdiction, um, it's much easier to go with the former. And it's certainly, certainly proved the, the case for us. And especially having people who are conversant with that existing and imperfect system. Next slide. Then the, we supported the outbreak response um, directly. So early on, it was all about uh, case management and contact tracing, trying to prevent an, ep uh, uh, an epidemic. Um, and so we rolled out case management tools on the back of our, of our platform. Um, just to advance one, one of the, the gender lenses of that was that the um, uh, many of the early kind of uh, super spreader events were in the essential services and many of the essential service workers were, uh, well, they, they were predominantly women. So our early epidemic was, was a very gendered early epidemic. Um, uh, and uh, you'll see further on that there's a male predominance in, mor in morbidity and mortality. And so we had, we even now we have more women infected, um, um, but more men uh, admitted and dying. Next slide. Um, the next was uh, just being able to track the response to kind of uh, guide the service service response. And so we, many of the slides that I showed you earlier on about, about the epidemic in the province, and we have an, uh, an example of a sub-district breakdown um, on the page. And we rolled out about 20 new reports specifically for management purposes to help guide, uh, guide the epidemic response. Uh, next slide. And then uh, direct, uh, moving away from operational and patient management was the epidemiological analyses. And uh, we were able to very rapidly uh, allow um, COVID-19 data with outcome data, in this case, mortality and with comorbidity data. Um, so the, the one area that was uncertain I mentioned earlier was the uh, impact of HIV. So we were able to look at the um, association between HIV and mortality. And uh, it was a mixed, mixed message. Uh, there was a higher association about a twofold increase in mortality. However, it was much more modest than we feared. And it certainly enabled us to, to proceed with our uh, operational planning uh, uh, with uh, be uh, better data. Next slide. And the, uh, uh, we confirmed what had been seen globally in terms of a male predominant. We definitely had more maternal mortality uh, uh, 2020 compared to previous years, but what we're not sure of is whether that is um, uh, uh, disease and age uh, uh, appropriate uh, uh, mortality in women of childbearing age, or whether it's uh, additive effect of pregnancy itself, and that's one of the epidemiological questions we're still trying to answer. Um, and then the other thing, um, the previous speaker spoke about all the collateral uh, impact of the interventions themselves and the, and the service gaps. And we have yet, we've seen massive impacts on service uh, delivery, but we yet to see a signal in terms of collateral uh, impact on uh, mortality um, and severe disease. In other words, we've seen four, fewer people admit, uh, started an antiretroviral treatment, fewer people getting routine follow-up, but the um, collateral impact is not yet showing. Uh, next slide. And then the last, the last area of adaptation was really just being able to share data very quickly with third parties. Um, and uh, we were able to share with modelers and uh, have a public facing dashboard. And that enabled us to uh, really um, 
uh, kind of engaged very widely in terms of getting support for what we were doing. Um, and the public facing dashboard that we have um, has had over 2 million uh, page views uh, since the start of the epidemic. Thank you so much, Andrew. That's so interesting. Um, so I think part of the reason we, we were so keen for Andrew's talk was because um, um, the sort of Provincial Health Data Center, which he, he leads and, and has really sort of helped to develop, um, is such a unique source for granular D patient level information about the epidemic and particularly its impact on women. Um, so I encourage you to ask questions about it. It's, it's this sort of provincial data center and the work he's presented is, is really sort of a unique anomaly. And I mean that in the best possible way for the, for the region. Um, um, so I don't know, Tikas, if there are any questions for, immediately for, for Dr. Bull or, or shall we move on to our next speaker? I think we can move on to the next speaker. Thank Great. you again, um, Dr. Bull. That was great. And just reflecting between the two presentations on how there's a lot of data to unpack um, through a lot of the COVID experiences. I now would like to actually transition over on the more on the sexual and reproductive health side, um, Dr. Juan Antonio Perez from the Commission on Population Development from the Philippines to give us an alternative or you know an additional um, case study moving on to the experiences in, in Asia and in the Philippines. Over to you, Dr. Um, Perez. Thank you. Good evening from Manila. Uh, can I have my next slide? Um, uh, what I've bro broken down my presentation to three areas. One is the background, which will cover the uh, potential impact, but there's also some data on the actual impact, particularly on service delivery as perceived by the public. So I'll cover that first. And then uh, we look at how uh, currently sexual reproductive health services in the Philippines are being delivered, particularly focusing on the way we have adapted by uh, using digital health and uh, alternative systems to ensure continuity of sexual reproductive health services and what we perceive to be a way forward uh, as it's a year uh, uh, since the pandemic started and uh, uh, apparently, this will be going on for some more time. Next slide. So, in the Philippines, uh, quarantines have been in place since March 2020. So, we're about a year into these uh, community quarantines. And some people say that we have had the long... In ...particularly in the capital region national capital region, travel restrictions and physical distancing have affected the workforce, uh, the uh, supply chain, uh, demand and access to essential uh, sexual reproductive health services. Uh, this is uh, coming from some studies, academic studies. Next slide. Um, in general, women are saying they're refraining from visiting health facilities for fear of exposure, particularly hospitals, you know, where they perceive many of the cases are. And they also have problems in moving around. You know? They have difficulties, even in the capital region, in uh, reaching health facilities. Next slide. In the survey, national survey we conducted in November, which is about eight months into the pandemic, 41% of those who were experiencing problems in uh, getting uh, reproductive health family planning services, uh, about 41% we believe were directly uh, um, talking about uh, uh, the effect of the pandemic on health services by saying there are now lots of processes where there were none before uh, non, uh, uh, the non-availability of health workers, uh, and in the capital region, long queues, which would which were discouraging them from accessing services. The other reasons have been there for a while, no? so they they've just persisted in the system. Uh, next slide. And there's a geographical. Um, difference, uh, uh, specificity. Um, for example, uh, the Mindanao region, which is the most, the least developed in terms of health system, uh, there's a greater degree of uh, perception that uh, 
uh, the services have been uh, disrupted. Uh, but in the national capital region, they complain about long queues. So the problems are different in different places. Next slide. Now, uh, in, a, in this national survey, we asked uh, women and men who were participating in the survey, what is their, uh, uh, the most important problem that they think women are facing? And uh, uh, three, uh, three fifths of them, 60%, almost 60% said it was uh, unplanned teen pregnancies, which is uh, a rising problem in the Philippines. But a good number also talked about violence. No? 11% uh, were worried about physical violence, 7% about sexual violence, and uh, another 7% emotional violence, so different forms of violence and unplanned pregnancies came out at 11%. So these are the major problems uh, that they feel they're facing eight months into the pandemic. Now, uh, we asked whether the government was responding well enough and to their problems and they said 57% said they felt that it was uh, somewhat adequate or very adequate, but a quarter were saying it's quite inadequate, very inadequate and somewhat inadequate. And somewhere in the middle, you have a larger group uh, saying that uh, it is, uh, they, they're not sure. But the major uh, problem of uh, inadequacy is seen in the national capital region again. Uh, so the disruption seems to be greatest in the areas where you have the longest quarantines uh, happening. Now, uh, the, our academicians have predicted that about 5 million Philippine women will have unmet need for family planning at the end of uh, 2020, primarily because of the disruption uh, to uh, family planning, reproductive health services. And this is a number that uh, is higher than what we were working on by about a million to one and a half million. So the increase is in that area. Now, uh, at the very uh, high uh, maximum, if uh, there is maximum disruption, our, our academicians say uh, there could be 2.5 million uh, un uh, pregnancies about uh, 700,000 of them would be unintended pregnancy. It's on top of our normal number of uh, births in a year. Um, but with the different uh, impact of, uh, of the quarantines in different areas, this might be what, might actual, what we might see this year is actually probably going to be lower. Also, when it comes to unintended Pregnancies among adolescents, they're predicting a 20% rise, uh, again, along with uh, the disruption, reproductive health services. So it affects, uh, they're, more, they're quite worried about the impact on adolescents. Next slide. Now, uh, what's happening, uh, in, what's been happening uh, uh, with regard to, uh, you know, moving forward or addressing the problems. Next slide. Um, we launched, uh, the commission itself launched a helpline, uh, and it's online, you can call, all, uh, all ways to reach, and uh, we have a tag, Usap Tayo Sa Family Planning. The helpline has uh, reached uh, thousands uh, between the period May to December, but actually there are other platforms aside from what we have that have uh, reached tens to hundreds of thousands. So helplines, uh, one is called RH Care, uh, which was developed by UNFPA, has reached quite a good number of, uh, and is uh, being used to access services. But the helpline that we have also allows uh, women to access services that they're not able to get today. Next slide. And we have launched programs uh, on Facebook. Next slide. Basically, to, uh, it's a talk show online. We launched in August, and we have a monthly program 
uh, live on Facebook and we have, uh, um, you know, uh, sometimes movie stars and, uh, you know, those working in the health sector doing heroic work and uh, the general public can join this uh, discussion. Next slide. We have also launched online videos for particularly for adolescents in our social media accounts. Next slide. And uh, virtual conversations with adolescents. Uh, we have rallies where several hundred uh, adolescents uh, log on and talk about their, their problems or what needs to be done. Now the way to continue to provide information through the helpline uh, to, and to increase awareness on population and development uh, by continuing to produce our talk shows, improving our social media campaigns, uh, really uh, have uh, increased the number of platforms where uh, people can uh, reach out and uh, access uh, services. We're going to launch an e-learning platform, particularly for health workers. Uh, and uh, people are saying they are relying more on community volunteers, community health workers. They are the main source of information right now for family planning. So we need to improve uh, our e-learning platforms and our platforms to reach out to volunteers. And uh, for adolescents, uh, we're launching uh, peer education programs. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Good evening from Manila. Thank you, Dr. Perez. That was very enlightening. Um, we have two questions and I'm wondering whether we take them in the chat or whether we can um, save them for later. But essentially there's a lot of interest about how these tools that you mentioned are being used in rural areas or for women that may not have access to mobile phones. If Dr. Perez, you'd like to quickly comment on that and then we can also discuss this further in the, in the Q and A. Yeah, um, access to mobile phones in the country is at about 85 to 90%. And what we do is just come out with this hashtag, advertise it on radio and uh, uh, the Department of Health uh, also works with us and talks about these hotlines uh, on in their press conferences. Um, however, our rural areas uh, might still have difficulty because uh, um, internet coverage is not that good in uh, some of our isolated areas. So we need the volunteers. I think one, uh, one thing we've revived is the role of community volunteers both providing services and commodities and providing information uh, because that's what people rely on. Thank you. So I wonder, Dr. Um, Prez, just a clarification. So, it, um, and I apologies for not knowing this statistic offhand, but um, what proportion of women in, in the Philippines have access to mobile phones? Is the 85% any access among men or is it, a, is it, I just wonder if you could comment because we see a, in a lot of places a big gender gap in women's access to, to mobile phones. Well, I'm, um, I'm not sure if there is, uh, you know, it's, there's a differential between men and women. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll have to look into that, but I believe sure. it's the same for both sexes. Uh, sure. It's about the same. Great, great. Thank you. Um, thank you again to Dr. Perez for that really sort of interesting talk from the Philippines. Um, we'd now like to shift our collective focus over to India. Um, we're very pleased to introduce Dr. Ranhan Krishna, who's the Principal Secretary for Health in the Indian state of Tamil, uh, Tamil Nadu, which is home to a population of just over 70 million. Um, to give you a sense of, of, of the, the, the scale, he oversees an incredibly vast network of primary, secondary, and tertiary hospitals, as well as medical colleges. Um, he's extensive experience also managing emergencies, including overseeing the response and relief efforts to the 2004 tsunami um, in Tanjavir district. In today's talk, he'll be providing an overview of um, how technology has been used to address women's health needs in, in the Tamil Nadu government's response to COVID-19. So without further ado, sir, over to you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, UN and U uh, UNDP and UNO for this uh, wonderful opportunity. And straight away, uh, because of the 10 minute deadline, come to the thing. Uh, excellent earlier presentations have already captured the kind of uh, interventions, digital uh, 
uh, facilities can go for this. First two slides, I would like to tell you the extent of problem. Like you rightly said, you know, we have seven to eight million population and we had next to Maharashtra, we had next highest cases in the beginning. And uh, now only 0.47% of such cases, 3,990 to be specific, are in the hospital as of yesterday. 98% have recovered. Uh, and we are a state where 1.47% people died, 12,500 people died of this disease. But most importantly, all the testings which you do are RT-PCR. We don't rely on this one unique state in Tamil Nadu in India, which does RT-PCR testing. Obviously, the gender age gap, I leave it uh, gender, uh, you know, 40% women got it, 60% men got it, and transgenders were around 35%. Next. This again would show that, you know, we are, uh, people seeing might say is that, you know, we are actually in a, a kind of, uh, unlike other parts of India, we peaked a bit early, July, August. And whereas India peaked around September, October, the first wave, and we have systematically come down. Uh, the cases have come down to less than 500 uh, uh, a day. But we are at, a, and even the death, you know, August 15th, we had almost uh, on a day, 127 deaths. July 27th, we had almost 7,000 cases a day. That has drastically come down. Cases are around 500 and below, oh, death is below five uh, on, a, uh, on an average. But having said that, we are witnessing a second surge in many parts of India, particularly Maharashtra, Punjab. And I don't think in Tamil Nadu will be immune to it because again, there is frequent travel and all. This is the background in which we are looking at the challenges women face. Next. Women cell during COVID already, you know, WHO, everybody, each one of you speakers and moderators have covered it. Pandemic, subsequent lockdown plays unprecedented demands on health system, especially among pregnant women. We had to take innovative measures to manage the prevailing situation. It was quintessential for delivering quality and care services. Accessibility due to lockdown, physical, affordability, financial due to unemployment, stressed financial services, social factors, fear of getting infected when seeking services and stigma. That was the initial challenge. TN came up with many innovative strategies, especially, especially IT driven in the next slides, which I'll explain, which were based on standard protocols, quality driven. Line list of all antenatal mothers were obtained from pregnancy and infant cohort monitoring and evaluation, RCH portal, and categorized as low risk, moderate risk, and high risk. District wise, around 798,000 lakh mothers uh, with expected date of delivery for the period March 24 to January 31st was obtained from this software and shared to the districts and chief district obstetrician for ready reference. The dashboard gave that you know safe, moderate, and high risk. User ID and passwords are created for mentor obstetrician. Obviously, you know in a block, maybe you know covering uh, uh, in a district, uh, roughly around 10 to 20 blocks were there. A district has a population of you know ranging from. Uh, 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 one crore, uh, almost uh, 10 million in uh, Chennai to some place uh, uh, 150,000. So user ID and password was created and 3,308 uh, uh, and uh, 257, uh, 3 lakh, uh, 257 high-risk mothers were identified and uh, mentor of uh, obstetric and gynecology specialist and block team from March 24th to January 31st took care of them. Next. This is the kind of dashboard. This I will share and you know subsequently email it uh, uh, to whoever is interested. This dashboard captures all the features which are required. Next. This basically would capture the data. Pregnant mothers could either go to an e-seva center which is available in a village or to a one not food toll free number they could call or to institutions, you know, whether it is at a medical college or a secondary care services or a primary care services. And of course, online also self-registration could be done. But that is, that is called as pre-registration. For villagers where, you know, people do not have these kind of access or they have access but are not familiar with it, village health nurses and urban health nurses used to do the antenatal care and the uh, registration and provide antenatal services. Delivery services and online delivery entry can be made by the convent institution itself. This flowchart will give you all the data. Next. Salient features were provision of pre-registration through the common service centers, other authentication. India, you have a unique identity card. 
and the reproductive and child health 14 digit id which was valid throughout india visitor mother in tamil nadu and for that matter many parts of the country many times mother go and deliver the first child in their native place so that visitor mother registration was made mandatory institutional delivery entry at all levels <coughs> Uh, has been the Tamil Nadu has 99.9 percent institutional delivery, and the most important this is civil registration system and the PICME software got integrated. Our former chief secretary, one Girija Vaidyanathan Madam, took the lead, and another project director, Dharay Sarmad, was instrumental in all this. This helped in ensuring that you know this could be done, uh, and various departments, you know, the revenue department, which looks after the districts, the municipal administration, local body department, and the public health. All of them got integrated so that the registration of birth and death and also the pregnancy registration could be integrated. Next, micro plan. This is where it, it comes to when COVID came. Micro plan work was worked out at all levels for tracking of mothers, mental obstetrician, block medical officers, primary health care medical officers, and village health nurse did the follow up. And high risk mother with an expected rate of delivery during lockdown period were. Followed up by this number, WhatsApp group were created. High risk mothers were mobilized to the nearest uh, 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 comprehensive emergency and obstetrics and neonatal care centers uh, for antenatal care via free one or two ambulances. Next, all level three facilities were designated as in the beginning of March and April when people refused. The government stepped in a big way, and they were designated as hospitals. And another block in the same hospital was made available for providing maternal health care services for COVID suspect and COVID positive people. And standard operating protocols were created and disseminated through social media. And universal precautions were doffing and donning, and rational use of PPE was introduced. Next. Again, this is the flow chart and how the chief district obstetrician guided these people. At the uh, district level, to the district headquarter hospital, up to the grassroots level. Next, then teach, train, and transform. The hospital infection control committee was activated for preventive and responding to healthcare associated infection. This is very critical. Mock drill exercises were conducted for better antenatal preparedness. Next. Teach, train, transform, telementoring. E Sanjeevani was a program introduced all India and Tamil Nadu. Next to the biggest state of Uttar Pradesh is the leader as far as OP and IP uh, services are concerned. Where we were able to give telemedicine was offered to the people with large scale awareness, and we, we uh, despite being one of the uh, better health providing states like Kerala, in spite of this, this E Sanjeevani was uh, successful. Virtual, virtual mentoring and real mentoring was done by the designated obstetrician. And awareness campaigns to ensure vulnerable groups, including women, uh, were well informed, was taken care of about the availability and accessibility of mental health related services, a very important factor during this initial part of COVID. Next. This is the, you know, was one of the scenarios how it was being done and the services of, you know, uh, digital platform being used. Next. Again, uninterrupted supply of blood, oxygen, drugs, reagents, and consumables, including personal protective equipment, were ensured for, uh, and mill stockouts were ensured through Tamil Nadu Medical Service Corporation and uh, Tamil Nadu AIDS Control Society, which monitors the blood. Apart from it, oxygen supply was augmented from 384 kiloliter to almost 800 kiloliters entire in the entire state. Next. Again, uh, we had you know disease-specific protocols developed. Whether it was kidney disease, cancer, hypertension, diabetes, cardiovascular, maternal health was a very important component of this, apart from the standard WHO and the Government of India protocol to ensure from the approved uh, uh, you know, category of drugs, child morbidities, mental health, TB, COPD, asthma for them. Disease specific protocol addressing COVID was being done. And the last two things, apart from geriatric HIV care, the nutrition and the maternal health part of it was very relevant for this pregnant woman. Next. I think IEC, like everybody said, was very important. Even now, social media is very important, including for vaccination. Of course, pregnant women are not covered and lactating women are not covered, but still, this is a very important part. Next. 
we are coming to the fight outcome almost 6600 you know we deliver almost uh, 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 1 million mothers a day a year and you know on a day 2500 mothers de get delivered but only 6648 mothers were positive out of which the maternal maternal deaths were 0.8% next again if you look at the positivity rate it peaked in august as i mentioned much ahead of other state maharashtra and tamil nadu peaked ahead and then we have come down to 0.43 but our worry is maharashtra is having a next peak so probably we shouldn't end up and you know in health we can never be uh, satisfied about what we have done so far but we have to look at uh, emerging challenges when you look at uk europe and other places we just can't uh, uh, and brazil we just can't uh, uh, take it lightly next gaps and challenges is i think perhaps the last rule giving direct access for women for our health records even though like philippines we, uh, women have equal access to phone not many have smartphone tamil nadu is currently uh, planning to address the same by establishing a population based register giving uhid unique health id for all beneficiaries accessing health facilities issues of internet connectivity in particular in hill areas is a challenge but the uh, e seva that is the Okay, the common service centers are doing that, and gaps in training among certain sections of healthcare staff. It's very easy to say that you know throughout Tamil Nadu everything was good, but that will not be the truth. There were challenges in tribal areas and remote areas. System readiness to adapt newer advancement were a challenge in the initial phases. Next. future plans adopting a e partograph at all delivery point this is a very important uh, thing because we would like to ensure that you know uh, we have the records with us so that we are able to uh, you know, do the interpartum monitoring we don't know when corona will go or when a new or a new disease comes or a existing uh, variant of a, a variant of an existing disease come spontaneous birth of a live female those everything gets uh, monitored these are some of our future plan next this is the last slide this is an example of case shield as i end in the concluding part i would like to say tm tamil nadu i'm um, in india was the first state to integrate the pregnancy uh, uh, information software to the civil registration system highest amount of maternal conditional cash transfer in india 18000 rupees which is a very substantive amount and it has a cash and kind component and it is linked to conditions is given in indian state which is uh, much higher than the 5000 rupees offered by the government of india for one uh, delivery we have conditions so that is one of the best practices we pioneered all it initiatives in maternal and child health universal health coverage and communicable diseases first state to conceptualize and plan for population health registry with a common denominator and a unique health id and all it models have been prepared in house as i end by saying that knowledge transfer is very crucial i have been part of undp between 2009 to 12 i have great faith in un allowing solution exchange facilities and these kind of interactions among various parts and various people in the world helps us in cross learning and improving the accessibility and uh, of services to the pregnant and uh, not only pregnant in all other schemes as we tackle this uh, uh, pandemic uh, corona thank you one and all for giving me a patient hearing thank you thank you so much for that very very interesting talk um i wonder if we have any questions for um for dr radhan krishnan um and otherwise we can turn it over to to kenne for for some closing remarks and then shift to a a q and a for all the speakers uh yes thank you amnesty and thank you dr krishnan um krishnan run for that great presentation and uh, there are just a few questions that um were asked about how nutrition programs were taken up in Tamil Nadu and how child marriages were prevented if you have any quick thoughts um remarks on that before we move on to Kenny I'll quickly respond we have a very good you know nutrition and you know, social welfare department with which we work and there are village level committees where they call it as anganwadi you know child welfare centers supplementary nutrition is given to women who are actually underweight and tamil nadu the biggest problem is not with regard to healthcare but with regard to quality nutrition 
for pregnant women, especially, you know, hemoglobin levels many a times are low. So this supplementary nutrition is a government uh, program, which is integrated with this uh, pregnancy women program. Second thing is when I talked about this conditional cash transfer of 18,000 rupees, 4,000 is given as a nutrition kit. Two kits are given immediately on registration and again after five months, which have this not only iron supplementation, but high nutritive values. As far as the next uh, question is concerned on child marriages, we have village level monitoring committees and a lot of awareness is that Tamil Nadu surprisingly is not a state which has this problem as much as in certain other parts of India, but we did have challenges of female infanticide and feticide. This again is given to the local panchayats where village officers and the health uh, nurses are part of this active membership who do the local level monitoring and of course it needs a lot of advocacy. Great, thank you. Thank you for that additional clarification. We'll, in the interest of time, we'll move on to Kenne from uh, UNDP and I'd like to open the floor to, um, to him to, as a discussant. Kenne is a policy specialist with the United Nations Development Program and his work focuses on enabling legal and policy environment for rights-based responses to health at the intersection of law, human rights, and gender. So Kenny, we're very glad to have you on and please, if you have any remarks as a discussant, over to you. Uh, thank you, thank you to guest and uh, my sincere appreciation to the, to the panelists for their presentations. So as, as highlighted by the panelists' uh, presentations, COVID-19 mm -hmm. has, COVID has had a very significant direct and indirect impact on, on health coverage, on utilization of services very broadly. But uh, this impact has also been very severe and dire in the, in the, in the context of sexual reproductive health services, and uh, uh, particularly with regards to the health of pregnant women and children. And we saw uh, a snippet of the potential scale and severity of the, of the, the disruption this has caused uh, in Dr. Diaz's uh, presentation. Um, COVID-19 has also accelerated uh, the adoption of digital technologies. Uh, this prior to COVID-19, the conversations had been crawling along uh, uh, in many quarters and in many co uh, countries, but COVID-19 almost uh, gave the push and the impetus um, to accelerate this quickly uh, as a way of mitigating the impact of the pandemic. Um, and and uh, uh, we've seen how these were deployed in the context of uh, the in the context that uh, that the panelists spoke to. The the case studies came from lower middle income country, uh, uh, countries, uh, and I'm happy to see that because it also provides inspiration for how uh, other contexts that uh, that are similar could think about adopting, adapting, and also addressing some of the challenges that uh, uh, the implementation or the uptake of these technologies invariably uh, produce. So for my reflection, I'll focus on two issues that I think are critical to, to, to successful deployment of digital technologies. And, and very necessary to improving and sustaining outcomes. The first is um, uh, the importance of analyzing the broader gender and health equity implications of the use of digital technologies uh, and IT tools. Uh, this is what uh, 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 Sina, uh, Sina and, uh, and Scary Roy call the invisible imperatives. And then secondly, I would, I would look at the impact of the broader legal and policy environment in a country on the kind of health objectives and outcomes that we're hoping for uh, with these tools. So digital technologies, as most of us already know, always highlight complex relationships and realities in the context where they are deployed. Um, they show for the cast the spotlight, as it were, on existing health inequities, on gender inequality, class di uh, di disparities, uh, on even power dynamics, uh, social exclusions where they exist, marginalization, and in some instances actually uh, perpetuate this and make them, make them worse than they originally were. And so while it is important for us to think 
and, and definitely monitor and report on indexes like service coverage, uh, service quality, cost effectiveness, um, all of these indexes on which, uh, on the basis of which some of our health, uh, this public health decisions uh, and tools are made. It's also important to ensure that we're equally tracking the whys behind the numbers and the figures that, uh, that uh, these monitoring efforts produce. Produce, and and that we should also be challenging the assumptions on which these interventions are premised. Um, I see, uh, you know, Andrew's presentation uh, looked a bit specifically at the gender perspectives from Western Cape, or from the Western Cape region in, in South Africa. But we should be asking questions, for instance, on what the differential experiences and the impact of these tools are on men and women on different categories of women in different settings what do we know about how they impact adolescents and young women versus older women literate and illiterate users those working in informal or informal settings migrants uh, versus nationals uh, what are the implications of, uh, and, and, I, and I saw this from, uh, to put, to put uh, Dr. Radhakrishna on the spot, uh, from his last slide, uh, uh, intake, intake documents that require name of father, for instance, or husband's name or caste, what do these mean for uptake and and uh, and a number of other dynamics uh, uh, related to to the deployment of of these technologies? So there's also the raft of issues uh, related to the gender digital divide, and I'm happy that somebody already asked the questions about access to uh, mobile phones. Uh, what what the numbers are, and and I and I even dare say beyond the access to, uh, we should also be interrogating actual usage uh, of, of mobile phones, even when there is access, especially for women. Uh, in many of these contexts, uh, mobile phones, computers, or laptops are shared by very many members of, um, of a household. And so how easy is it often in reality for a woman um, to access these tools on sexual reproductive health care uh, in, within such context? Um, so these are some of the challenges that already have been alluded to in some of the presentations, but which uh, beg to be to be answered as uh, as we discuss uh, how digital technologies are being deployed uh, in relation to women's health, and and also questions about the additional burden of work on on the healthcare workers, especially the community healthcare workers who now have to take on uh, these new uh, tools uh, as they're being deployed. What is the investment from the part of the state on implementation research to understand all of these issues? We should be thinking about mental health, uh, wellness programs, training and upskilling so that as they're, uh, as they're um, uh, trained on new technologies, uh, they are upskilled to reduce the burden on, on other aspects of their work. Uh, how much is being invested in systems upgrades to ensure that there's interoperability between these new platforms and other aspects of the health systems. And of course, there's always concerns about potential human rights violations, breaches of privacy and confidentiality, uh, data, uh, data sharing practices of, con of countries. These all have an impact on how users will interact uh, and how honestly they will provide information on these platforms. And this brings me to my second point, which is the broader legal environment. Um, we saw an avalanche of legal responses from countries uh, as COVID-19 came. And many of these laws were driven by panic, very reminiscent of the early days of HIV, when in the confusion of not knowing what the virus was about and the modalities and modes of infection, countries just legislated on everything. Many of those are still in the books 40 years down the line and wrecking havoc. Um, at UNDP, together with WHO and other partners, we, we started tracking these laws in what we call a COVID-19 law lab and it's accessible online. And so far, we've collected about 2,000 pieces of laws and policies looking at a range of issues that governments have legislated on emergency response, uh, access, use of technologies, criminalization of public health infractions, mandatory testing. I mean, some of these things are things that we had already taken for granted as settled in other epidemics. And all of a sudden, they are the way to go now. And so we need to be thinking about what these mean 
for the context where these technologies are being deployed. We can't turn a blind eye on them. Laws are very, and I'm a, I'm a lawyer, we know that it's very easy to respond to law. It's, it's almost a classic case of to, to the carpenter. Every, every, everything is, uh, is a nail, you know? Uh, countries deploy these laws, but they are much more difficult to get out of circulation. And that's some of the challenge we've seen with HIV 40 years later. I wonder if we could just get some responses, um, if, if any of our panelists wanna just sort of respond to some of the sort of very interesting comments you've raised. Um, and so maybe I could just start from the top um, with Dr. Diaz, if you have any sort of thoughts and response to some of the, the, the comments um, Kenny has raised, and then we'll go down the line. Not in particular, because mine was more of a global uh, look at, at, the, at, at the situation. Um, I know that I was asked uh, in the chat to about um, how can we engage with women um, who are not being reported through the health information system or accessing the health facility. And, and so I have responded that, that there is some um, community um, assessment tool as well. But I, I think that um, others might be able to, to more better respond uh, to the points that were, were, were just uh, uh, brought up. Sure, well, thank you so much. So are there any other comments from any of our, our panelists um, before we turn to some of our questions? Um, Dr. Radhan Krishnan or, or Dr. Perez? Uh, see, I, I think he has uh, touched upon a number of issues. It's like you said, for uh, yeah. uh, quite a lot to answer. But one thing which I find is that, you know, Oh, I, like he was mentioning, it's easier to talk of accessibility, but uh, uh, ability to utilize. So I find that the village health nurses and the accredited social health activity, activists uh, in the tribal areas who get trained really bridge that gap. Uh, that is one issue. Having said that, again, uh, in these uh, states also, we cannot say that everything is uniform everywhere. So there are specialist, specialized interventions which both the government and many times non-governmental organizations with empathy enter and help us in uh, ensuring that they get empowered. As far as uh, uh, husband, father's name, these are all challenges, you know, so again, in our place to uh, uh, give power to transgenders. Of course, it doesn't uh, relate to delivery. These were all challenges, which I think the Supreme Courts have also intervened. And uh, uh, some of the recent judgments empowering women are also very good. But again, having said that, this is all a work in progress and uh, varying levels of uh, uh, you know, oh, empowerment is there, but for uh, people not getting job, this uh, uh, conditional cash transfer, which I mentioned, was a very important in intervention with the late chief minister. Of course, the scheme is there for years together, but uh, Madam Jalalita ensured that it becomes 18,000 with 4,000 for a, a kind thing, but 14,000 ensuring that they get that uh, uh, money on their name and uh, they can utilize it. That itself was empowering in particularly very poor sections of the society. Thank you. Thank you so much. I wonder, Dr. Perez, I know, um, I'm, I'm sure a lot of what Dr. Radhan Krishnan said, uh, particularly with regard to the frontline health workers, resonates with, with what you sort of very art, uh, kindly articulated um, for the Philippines. I wonder if you have any thoughts in response to that. Yes, I, uh, on a couple of things uh, from what uh, Kenny said, now, um, first, on uh, community volunteer health workers, there are about five of them for each of the, our 42,000 villages of so varying numbers of population. And um, they have been given multiple tasks by, uh, with COVID. No? First, they were asked to supply food to those uh, being uh, you know, quarantined. Next, they were also, they have also been tapped to do contact tracing. And we also asked them to help out uh, for those women who could not go to health centers uh, to get their pills, uh, men who could not get their condoms. Uh, they were, we asked them to deliver them when they make their rounds. So they have been used quite a lot. Uh, by local governments and local health systems. That's why and, uh, in November, women said, oh, we rely on our uh, health workers for information on family planning. And uh, that is something that we need to work on. Uh, second, uh, on laws uh, uh, about uh, 
uh, we had the public health law on uh, epidemics that was passed just before COVID, maybe a year before. And it was really meant for health workers uh, to risk on how they would respond to epidemics, quarantines, etc. But probably it had not really been meant for a situation of uh, where you have month long quarantines. No? And uh, when it came to implementation, it was not the health workers that were implementing the public health law as intended. Other actors came into play, police, you know, uh, uh, other authorities who would not be able to interpret that law well enough that uh, pub, uh, public health workers would. So I believe those are in a way unintended consequences when the health sector is too spread out and they're not able to provide the correct support that's needed in a crisis. That's uh, just to respond to Kenny, thanks. Thank, thank, thank you, so you Dr. Perez, and um, thank you, Kenny, some as well. And I see that we only have about two minutes left and a lot of stuff to discuss. I just wanted to put out one last question that we received in, or two questions that we received in the chat. Um, again, this is along the same lines of what was being discussed to Dr. Perez and Dr. Radha Krishan. If a woman attends for ANC but does not present for delivery or just loses contact with the health system, how will they be contacted to check on her well-being? Um, and is such follow-up possible at scale? So I'll ask this question to Dr. Perez and Dr. Radha Krishnan, and then to also Kenny, if you can provide a link, I think you can perhaps type the answer directly to the public database on COVID-19. And as, respond, as panelists, as you respond to these questions, I just have one final ask. Um, in a post-COVID, scenario how what do you think are going to be some of the lasting impacts or some of the ways that we can actually ensure the sustainability of some of these mitigation efforts if you can also respond to that as you close out your your sessions including to kenny as well thank you all over to uh, maybe dr perez if you want to continue on from the yeah, yeah a quick answer on uh, on uh, antenatal care um as uh, Teresa was saying, just before COVID, we were doing so well. We were making great progress. We had a reproductive health law that uh, uh, was, uh, you know, uh, had doubled the family planning uh, coverage. However, um, and we had the plan, uh, barangay or community health workers and midwives really attended to every pregnancy and they had a health plan, they had a delivery plan and uh, they had they kept good records. Unfortunately, right now, as uh, also was reported earlier, the health data coming from the field is much delayed. Um, right now we have data up to the third quarter of last year. And so we're about five, six months delayed in, uh, in uh, still facing a and I really can say if they've been able to maintain this good work. In Tamil Nadu, actually, the first delivery, mostly the women go to another place. So one important thing is we have, we have worked on a unique ID and the visitor mother, that's a very peculiar term called as visitor mother. She is visiting her native place, but the, that village health nurse records that. But most importantly, the conditional cash transfer, which is a, a fairly substantive 18,000 you know, in rupee terms, you may not be able to, everybody may not be able to immediately convert. It is a very substantive amount of month. It is not given in one shot. So they have to open a bank account. So generally it's a mutual uh, uh, connection. They, they want the five installments in full. They uh, ensure that that has really incentivized uh, getting followed up and themselves also following up. That would be my answer to it. But uh, very rarely, uh, we also utilize the, in the tribal areas, uh, uh, the uh, accredited social health activists. Unlike uh, Philippines, uh, and unlike many parts of India, we don't uh, have the social health activist volunteers in all the places, but only in tribal and disease specific areas, they also follow up. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, uh, um, Teresa, any other closing thoughts or comments? I'll go to then Kenny, and then I'm going to come to Claudia. Um, well, over to you, Teresa. 
Well, first of all, we, uh, as you said, we, we did have great progress and unfortunately COVID might have come in and, and um, disrupted some of the, that progress and we need to really work multi-sectorially, as I said, to order to maintain it. One of the thing that's not related to my talk, but we are working on a mitigation project and there's a lot of telehealth solutions that have been um, out there now. Um, to be able to reconnect with people and also to provide um, certain uh, services when the women cannot come. Uh, and, and we should be um, exploring those and continuing with those. And there's tons of innovations that have been developed during COVID that um, we have been looking at and maybe should be maintained. I can't go through the whole list, but maybe should be maintained uh, for, for the future. But thank you for um, inviting me to this talk. Thank you so much, Dr. Diaz. Um, Kenne, over to you, and then Claudia, I'm coming to you next. Yeah, no, thank you so much for the opportunity. I mean, just to stress that um, key to recognizing these invisible imperatives is to keep communicating with uh, and engaging communities uh, on the impact of these, uh, of these uh, tools, both intended and unintended, and then have multi-sectoral conversations. Uh, just as uh, Dr. Perez has shown, there are other stakeholders who do not understand completely what's going on in the health sector, but whose work is uh, uh, in, in, impacts on it. So we need to also make sure that there's a whole of government, whole of system approach uh, to sustain the successes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kenny. Um, Claudia, did you have anything you wanted to add to this? And I'm sorry, we've sort of, run out of time for, for more formal remarks. Um, over to you, Claudia. No, it's okay. I just would like to thank the, the audience and the panelists for the brilliant presentations for the different angles of the digital response. And uh, I would like just to say that, um, that this webinar series is part of the Gender and Health Hub of the United uh, Nations University's International Institute of Global Health in Malaysia. And we will be launching the hub in the, on the 26th of March during the CSW65, the Commission on the Status of Women. And I believe the link for the registration is in the chat. So please register it and, uh, and keep um, uh, with us for the, next, uh, um, for the next session and all, all the other events uh, of the Hub. Thank you. Thank you so much, Claudia. So just to again, you know, reflect Claudia is really leading this effort. Um, so we, we thank her at, um, for the opportunity to, to present here on behalf of the, the Gender Health Hub. Um, and just also to acknowledge uh, BBC Media Action is co-curating this along with us at the University of Cape Town. Um, so so we, we sort of acknowledge, acknowledge them as well. Um, um, so I, I realize we're just about five minutes over time. Um, Tegas, can I ask you to take us out? Yeah, yeah, no, thank you very much. Talk. It was a real honor and pleasure to be on this panel um, alongside a lot of the esteemed uh, colleagues here. I just wanted to make sure that we'll be disseminating um, the recording and presentations because I think there's a lot of rich findings and insights that we'd love to be shared beyond the participants that um, were able to join us today. So thank you all. And we hope to con continue sharing these findings and exchanging as Dr. Radhakrishnan eloquently presented or um, said earlier. Thank you all and have a great day. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. And again, thanks to our panelists. And we hope you'll join us for our next session on the 25th. Um, that's going to be about gender-based violence and technology use and response um, to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so, so we look forward to seeing you there. And um, thank you again to all of our panelists. And um, happy Thursday, everybody.